Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, spirited conversations with interesting people. I am your host, Christopher Harden. Today, we are in our backup studio doing a little technical difficulty, but I get to sit down with two very, very special gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who know Crowded Barrel Distillery out of Austin, uh, there is the Whiskey Tribe guys, Rex and Daniel Whittington, who uh, together, their two whiskey channels on YouTube have more than 700,000 subscribers and have collected more than 75 million views. They are the king cream de la creme of whiskey YouTube channels, and they are just incredibly nice guys. So today I sit down with them to talk about everything they've got going on, a little bit about who they are, what they've got in the works, and of course, what we, you know, to discuss our current state of affairs in the online whiskey community. Uh, they were amazing guys, very happy to, to get a chance to sit down with them, and uh, yeah, without further ado, please welcome Rex and Daniel from the Whiskey Tribe. Cheers. Let's jump into it. I'm excited. I sent you guys a bottle. Uh, it's sitting there right right front and center. Uh, yes. And, and I know I, the, the, it's already kind of basically, it's sold out in three days. So I, I didn't send it to you guys to get promotional or anything. I just, I wanted you to have something tasty to drink and, and to, to get your feedback. And, and Awesome. What is this? What, what are we looking at here? Well, uh, golf did this with you. Yes, that's correct. So uh, me and Golf Coast are now quite involved together officially cool. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so this is uh one of the first projects we we launched uh it's called the prideful goat okay. uh, uh try to thought of you know because there's always some s- silly kind of arbitrary story on the back of these bottles that make no sense so we we and we when we actually uh sent this uh, to, the, to their people to, to work on the back of the bottle. They came back with this really fanciful story and we were like, no, 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 no. Like the, w- the, the whiskey community is so cynical and hateful that they're going right. to see this and they're going to, they're going to jump on the chance to shit on it. So we, uh, and by the way, you feel free to speak freely. We, that's what we, the radio portion will be cleaned up quite a bit. <laughs> um, okay. okay. Fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, so we, we tried to make it very lighthearted and kind of make fun of that on the back of the label and just kind of, uh, make a joke about being a, you know, like a, a, a prideful goat. So we, we, we thought it was, uh, so read me. What does the back say? What do we got? It says, uh, whether on a brave solo trip or a social venture with a herd goats can take on new terrain or not. <laughs> Look, we admire a goat's craving to explore and all, but more importantly, that it doesn't take itself too seriously, which is a little known fact about goats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Most people don't know that. Goats don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah, no, sheep, not at all. on the other hand, douchebags. Oh, yeah, and that's ironic considering yeah. that goat is shorthand for greatest of all time, but they're still humble enough. Yeah, yeah so, so and I think some people made that leap as well, too. And really, we were just looking for some, like, you know, long term, you know, maybe a, an Irish bar eventually with the brand, maybe something more along yeah. the logo. Yeah. So it had nothing to do with goat as in the greatest of all time. But well, you'll be so, getting a cease and desist because I'm starting a new pub now called the Prideful Goat. <laughs> so, well, we uh, own the trademark, so you'll be getting the, the cease oh, and desist. <laughs> Too slow. <laughs> all right. The 15 year Kentucky bourbon whiskey, which is what this is. Where is it coming from? Uh, well, we're not supposed to say. Oh. <laughs> as, oh. as, right. you're, as you're familiar, I can tell you where it's not from. It's not from Beam. It's not from Buffalo Trace. And it's, it's not, not from Barton? It's not from Barton. Okay, that helps. Okay. And yeah. Uh, you and narrow it down to the one obvious place. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> it's not and from, to cask yeah. strength, you're getting a bourbon straight from the barrel, hand-picked with some help from the herd. So sit back or don't. And enjoy our little project. I would have loved it if you had ended that sentence with "or don't." <laughs> that would have been the perfect finish to this or whole don't. thing. Whatever. Yeah. We don't. It just and says, enjoy our little project. 
or don't or don't <laughs> fuck you just, just like really dress it up <laughs> <laughs> the uh the uh yeah so it was just you know i mean we years we invited uh the the our group of followers the houston bourbon society and mm-hmm. someone say whiskey a dallas club and right. uh, they tasted through some some blends and picked their favorite one and and that's that's what we released so what else is 15 years old in the kentucky industry anything what's closest to that on a generic um, release so there's there's been a there's been quite a few of the same source, just different brands that have been released recently. Right. Uh, this is the cheapest one. This is a hundred dollars, and it's kind of unheard of now to see a fifteen, 15 year, year old. Year. Yeah. yeah. You know, fifteen year old Kentucky. It's nice. Yeah. Bourbon for a hundred bucks. So. Yeah. No, I'm just wondering, like in general, who's releasing a fifteen year old bourbon? Right. Not mm-hmm. a brand. I just mean like, well, maybe what's on the retail shelf that if I wanted to compare this to another 15-year-old Kentucky bourbon of any brand and any kind. It's just not, those age statements just aren't really out there for bourbon, right? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't think, I think, I think uh, a different distillery, possibly called Heaven Hill, they, uh, they, they do a, I think they released a 14-year, but I, I haven't seen any 15 right. in a while. Wow, that is surprisingly low oak tannin yeah. for a 15-year-old. How many barrels are in this? Uh, so four barrels. They, they, okay. the feedback has been exactly that, that it's not too overly oak for, oak for its age. So yeah. And 57, uh, did you guys, you guys just left it alone. That's what the four barrels added up to. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's not a, I know there's an art to blending and all, but no, we just, right. we, left, we left it alone and uh, it's, it's pretty, it's good as it is. So we didn't really need to do a lot to it. Are you um, seeing, good. are you seeing any trends in uh, the Houston bourbon society where, you know, there's a particular brand that's or maybe like a mash bill that people are really starting to gravitate towards? That's a good question. And I actually, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask you guys today uh, was to discuss future trends, like projections. There was a great episode done with the Bourbon Pursuit guys where they kind of discussed where they think bourbon is headed. Uh, And you guys being entrenched in all things whiskey and having quite the following yourself. I mean, a a modest following to say the least. Uh, (laughs) I'm eager to see what you guys are noticing and what you, where you think we're headed. I know the term bubble kind of gets thrown around a lot, but bubble implies a false base and, and there's not really uh, bourbon's doing very well. It's not going anywhere. So um, as far as particular mash bills, no, I mean, I think there was a little bit of a weeder thing going on for a while. A lot of people mm-hmm. were kind of, you know, cause you know, Weller's weeded, Packy's yeah. weeded. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I think I don't, I don't see anyone obsessing. I think rye, rye's really kind of going through a, a beautiful resurgence. Yeah. yeah, that started, that's been a slow roll straight through, right? Well, and, and you and I both, um, whenever we start, first started making content, we were at this place where rye was probably close to our least favorite category. Yeah. But yeah. there's just been this very slow progression over time where we keep finding more and more rye that we really like. And I think the reason for that, which is probably true in the entire rye experience as we've been watching it for the last decade, is... Um, when you first get started in rye, you think of rye as one thing. Mm-hmm. And especially if the majority of rye on the market are sourced from, from MGP, MGP. <laughs> right? at the time, yeah. it's like it, the easily accessible stuff with, you know, Overholt and Rittenhouse and then a bunch of MGP brands, yeah. right? Um, and then, uh, then you start exploring everything rye. Can you get your hands on Monongahela rye, like Wiggle or, you know, or these guys, or uh, Dad's Hat, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and you're like, oh, oh, rye. Rye can do so much more than I thought. Yeah, I, I think as a category, it probably has been the, the redheaded stepchild for a while. Um, and there's a lot to explore that even whiskey enthusiasts haven't really you know, prioritized to date. Um, that said, I still don't think rye as a category is going to be the most beginner-friendly entry point. It's a bit too spicy. You, most people... Whenever they're getting started into whiskey, they want something that's going to be a little bit more effortlessly dessert sweet. Um, and rye, unless they come into it through some type of rye-based cocktail. Yeah, I, guess I think rye, rye is something that you grow into and you learn to love more and more. But there's probably other categories that are more beginner-friendly. Well, I, um, I, think, I think that, like, and I'm, I'm not, I love you, honey, I'm not taking a shot at you but uh, in, in my experience with my wife being married that you never spend time with me anymore <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> if we if we go to a restaurant uh, and it's our first time at that restaurant and she orders us something that she doesn't like it kind of ruins that restaurant for her permanently huh. uh, uh, there was this great steak joint uh, on this side of town that 
uh, everyone was raving about. We went there. She ordered. They recommended the duck breast. It was awful. And mm-hmm. so when we talked about going back, we just didn't. She, I couldn't convince her to go. Yeah. And I think people are that way with whiskey. I think the reason why bourbon is for everyone is bourbon's relatively narrow. And you're mm-hmm. getting into a category that anyone can jump into. Their expectations are met. They know yep. exactly mm-hmm. what to expect. And it's pretty consistent. Rye is like scotch. The palate and ability of where rye can go is pretty wide. Yeah, and that's true. I never thought about it that way. Because if you pour somebody a Laphroaig and they don't know that, you know, Glen Rothes exists, yeah. then that's a then, big deal. And people say, I don't like whiskey because it's too smoky. I'm like, well, no, there's tons of other scotch out there that's not smoky. Mm. And I think that's the same thing with rye. The category of rye is all over the place. Between Alberta and yeah. MGP alone are two different animals completely. Uh, Russell's Reserve makes a phenomenal rye. It's, it's just, it's too broad that if you start someone on the wrong rye, then it kind of, it could, it could ruin them for it. So yeah, um, yeah I, I, it is a bit of a responsibility. Once you become known in your friend circle as the whiskey guy, uh, then making sure that the, the, the bottles that you're choosing for them to try, you're kind of not just sharing your personal favorites because the, the likelihood of you being really far down that path of you know, flavors and proofs that are advanced, that you have to have some experience under your belt to fully appreciate, the chance is very real that what you are adoring right now is going to be totally, totally what that person needs whenever they're getting into it. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I think one of our best performing videos of all time is just a beginner whiskey list because people want stuff that it's not going to hurt them. It's flavors that they can wrap their head around. Um, and to, to circle back to one of your earlier questions about you know, trends that we're starting to see, one that I think is already beginning to happen to a noticeable degree is the extent that more and more um, makers are getting into blending from a lot of different sources. And that's very exciting. I yeah, like, they've always blended. Yeah. But all it's of a sudden... It's becoming much, much more um, accepted. Yeah, to I think, talk about it. I think Compass Box did a lot of pi- uh, pioneering in that space. 100% but agree. Yeah. yeah. And but then High West sort of took it up on the craft mantle. Yeah. Right? And uh, ab- among many others. But it's no longer a dirty word. Yeah. You know, now it's like, oh, we blended this thing. And as long as you tell everybody where everything came from, everyone's keen to try this interesting thing yeah, it's got to be it's got to be transparent and i think you and i were talking about this it's either yesterday or the day before but i i equate it to you go to a restaurant and there's some chefs that they want to have their own personal garden where they're growing their own own ingredients like that is damn respectable that's amazing um but there's other chefs that are just sourcing from all of these places in the world just to have amazing ingredients and i think blending whiskey is much akin to that Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think I know that, um, <clears throat> like for years, the word "sourced" was a, a an ugly word. Well, because people were doing it poorly, and they're they're obfuscating the truth. It was very frustrating. It's basically just bullshitters and liars Agreed. putting stuff in a bottle, slapping a label Carpet on it, baggers. trying to trying to pull you know the wool over yeah. people's eyes. And that should have been despised. Yeah, it still should be despised. Yeah, yeah. But that's not all sourcing, right? Yeah. And as long as you're transparent, and I think we do exist in a realm because of people like yourself, because of channels like yourself and the bourbon junkies. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's, it's specifically, you've got a much more educated consumer now that knows what to look for and is also a bit more accepting when someone does source, but is being transparent about it. Whereas before it, it initially, it was just like, no, it's all bad. And, uh, I mean, there's a great channel called bourbon real talk with, uh, with Randall Solomon. He's actually, uh, me and him are both, the the behind the prideful goat, uh, it, where you, you you go out of your way to to really kind of get ahead of what is very commonly misconstrued or misunderstood yeah. uh, by the consumer and and I think it now it leads to people like yourself and Iron Root and Jake Clements with the Texas Whiskey Festival being able to work with like five different distilleries and put together their own blend and mm-hmm. it's all now it's more supported versus uh, you know immediately written off yeah, and that's uh, one of the cool things we were talking about the irony is. If you go back to the origins of Old Forester, he was sourcing and blending barrels. Rectifier, yeah. 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 So it's like, no, this is the whole history of all categories of whiskey. Sourcing, rectifying, blending. Yeah. All origins of all whiskey other than farmers. Yeah. Right. But whiskey has commerce. Yeah. All the origins of it are sourcing and blending. That's I mean, the, the Van Winkles. 
Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, let's not forget the, the <laughs> brand built off rectifying. Same thing with Wild Turkey. They were sourcing, and uh, and now those those companies uh, are iconic. That said, I I do think there is something romantic and worthy of a tremendous amount of respect whenever people, whenever distillers decide I'm only going to work with stuff that I make. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've tried, you know, several hundred at least craft bottlings at this point. And some of them, you know what, you, you, you respect the effort, but what lands in the bottles, like, "Ah, okay, you got some work to do before it becomes amazing. Other things are just phenomenal that could go toe to toe with some of the biggest brands in the world that have gone, that have been in business for generations. That's one of the things that I've loved about. I mean, we're we're crawling in on over a thousand craft things that we've tried now. Yeah, um, and not just a thousand stories, but a thousand products. Right. So, right. Um, one pattern that we've seen with, if we're going back to the, I made this whole thing from grain to now it's in a bottle. Uh, one of the things we're seeing right now is this last year in yeah. 2020, the craft stuff that we tried mm-hmm. was by and large at minimum like that's good and a lot of them remarkably good. When we started the channel, it was like what, four years ago or whatever. Somewhere around there. Most yeah. of the craft stuff we tried was like, eh, A for effort. Not my there, thing. There would be occasional right? outliers where that's, wow, it's very, very right. exceptional whiskey. Yeah, and we knew a lot of them, which was a problem because it started <laughs> to look like we were like only talking about our friends. You yeah. know? It's like, well, shit, Balconis is always good. Damn it, Jerry. Iris is always good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just fuck something up once. <laughs> Just once. I need the street crit. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but no, and th- so for like a first couple of years, every time we got craft, it was, you know, 20% of them were remarkable and 30% were like, that's fine. And then half were like, right. Mm, not I think you're, I, thing, I think you're right? being a bit generous as well. I think yeah. I, I mean, we've, we've come a long way. Texas has come a long way. Yeah. Um, I, but this I, is across I, the U S you know, I mean, now it's like the things I'm finding from little knucklehead to stories I've never even heard of right. that I think this would stay on my shelf. It's remarkable. Yeah, I think the thing that's most frustrating for me about the craft that you and I experience, and we know this is great, this is phenomenal, everybody needs to try this, the scale is very low. And then also so many people that are in that craft space, they're, they're not even business-minded in the second degree. I mean, that is like one of the last things on their mind. They are artists first, and then trying to put together a viable business model is something that they hope to do someday, maybe if good things happen, but they don't really understand the mechanics of how to scale and grow and maintain quality control. And what I would love to be able to do more and more is identify these amazing craft distilleries and reach out to them. And they already have a model in place. They already have a pricing structure, a plan, a shipping grow. model in place where we could be sourcing from them. We could be featuring from them. But very often you'll reach out to these guys and be like, oh, what? You, well, you want to buy a barrel? How did you get our bottle? What's going on? Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, guys. Well, this is why musicians, famous musicians had managers. Yeah. Right? But in, they had no idea what they were doing. They, they just had no idea what they were doing and it came to exactly. marketing shit. But the stories are starting a small business. So it's assumed that you're supposed to know something about business and marketing. Right. But it's totally not true. It's a whole bunch of artists in the business game. Yeah. One of the most um, heartbreaking things is whenever we'll uh, get to a bottle, you do the research and you realize uh, this whiskey that we're having, which is exceptional, mm-hmm. they're no longer in business. Yeah, they will. They They're couldn't make now. it work. The product was there. The quality was there. It's just, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, a, it's, it's a tough business to be in if you don't know how to, especially in the early years, get past the stage where you're making stuff, trial and error. You're putting it in a barrel. You're, you're trying to find Hoping things to, trying to find things to pay the bills with. But usually you're doing like gin or vodka or something like that. And the ones that don't make it, they make amazing whiskey. That's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Speaking of uh, uh, Jared, going back to him, I was watching a video that you guys were doing and you were talking about your love for synthetic corks. Yeah. And yeah. I can't convince Jared to, to use synthetic corks. <laughs> He's so in love with the classic. I mean, yep. this, is, this is a guy who rolls his own cigarettes and still wears fanny packs and makes it look cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> like this, yeah, that's true. He, he won't, he well, won't I mean, give up. It may be a bit generous. I mean, it's a look. But I don't know if it's a cool look. <laughs> Wait, really? Are you? Hey, are you now the the Arvinger of talking about all things the, fashion? Vintage mall store, circle circa two thousand three, baby. Come on. Yeah, my <laughs> my wife my wife's got five sisters, and uh, I go off their feedback, and all of them are quite a, a, infatuated with with Jared's look. So there you go. Uh, it, right. It's it's not it's it's 
he does have he's that. He's got a vibe the ladies are loving. Yeah, yeah. that he, that dirty hippie machismo. It's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one, <laughs> <laughs> that one dreadlock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love I love Jared. I, I wish they would give up the. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like a good classic cork but I, I i feel like synthetic corks are so much more efficient and he's like there's something dirty about my liquid touching a cork and i'm or a, a synthetic cork i'm like all right well uh speaking of which <laughs> daniel you are the secretary of yeah. the texas whiskey association i'm actually the secretary did you know that that's my official role okay secretary you want to be yeah. my secretary no one of my, my take my calls. <laughs> yeah, one of my one of my questions was uh, if the entirety of Crowded Barrel is being represented at the Texas Whiskey Association by one of you two, Rex. Why do you hate Texas whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not that I hate Texas whiskey. I love Texas whiskey. I hate compliance. I hate like rules and stipulations and subparagraph whatever. I am so allergic to that. I want nothing to do with it. Daniel, go be a secretary. Yeah. I'm going to do the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, the Texas Whiskey Association and Texas in general has come so far in terms of developing. And I've talked about this a, a bunch and I know my listeners are, are tired of it, but the, we're in the era of yes, where you can approach a distillery having a, a whiskey festival and say, uh, approach four distilleries and say, we'd like you all to come together and make very little money and make a blend and the answer is yes right like it's such yep. an achievement what jake has done uh it, it just unifying the the texas distillers uh yeah i th i think that was the first time you and i met it was very briefly but I oh think you it remember texas me? yeah texas whiskey festival we were outside like this little church and uh, we came up and we had a nice short conversation yeah yeah, well, I'm considered me colored me flattered. I I I had a cigar. I had a cigar with Daniel later that night. And I was like, he had no idea who I was. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I I knew who you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, I knew you were because we've been hanging out and talking. And Jared was like, you know, Houston Bourbon and Chris. I'm like, yeah. He's like, this is Chris. I'm like, oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah my yeah. my name floats around, good or bad. But it was nice to put a name to a face. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I wrote a couple things down. I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, let's see. Doo -doo -doo. I know you guys have, uh, I, I, so I went back through and was watching uh, a stream of videos. I, sh I was sure I hadn't seen, saw you guys working on a gen project. I saw you worked on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, the reason why we laugh. Okay. Yeah. The reason why we laugh is because we shot our podcast for the Patreon. Um, just moments before we got on this with you. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my question is Daniel. I was like, Daniel, I'm going to ask you a question. I know you don't want me to ask the question. You're very annoyed every time I ask the question. But here's the question How's our gin coming, Daniel? Motherfucker. Except, yeah. Yeah. It's so not, you're, yeah. you're having some issues logistically or just the it's, nightmare? Well, we just yeah. can't get MGP the, to give a shit. So it's the red tape. Of the, their prioritization right now is obviously not in their gin space. Mm, just right. getting them to reply so we can put in a meaningful order. Yeah, they're not just but they're it's not, not putting, meaningful according to their game. No, I guess not. But no. for us it would be meaningful. Yeah, no, we created a blend from the samples they sent us and we we're like, this is what we all voted on. Yeah. And then I reached back out and he was like, I don't know if we can do that. I'll get back to you. And so I waited a couple of weeks, call back nothing, call back nothing, well, but, call back nothing. Tracked down another MGP rep right. who works with somebody else that we know in the Midwest right. who they love him. I've been calling him and emailing him for a month and never heard so, back. So, you know, just, from, just send them a picture of their stock price and be like, you sure you guys don't <laughs> want to respond to my email? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, to, to, from their side of things, I think the, their initial understanding of what we wanted to do with our gin order was, it, I think they wanted, I, I think they assumed we wanted them to blend these components together. Mm -hmm. Like, no, 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 these are individual orders. We'll do all the blending and the yeah. amount that you think we need is like, we'll get four times that amount. It's, it's good. Just contact us. We want the freaking gin. Yeah. Yeah. We're both, we like gin. And to that episode that I think you saw, um, it was funny whenever we realized uh, distillers, whiskey makers who, pray, who see themselves as just whiskey is my heart song. The thing that they go to whenever they're not drinking whiskey, it's so often is gin. And it makes sense. It's a completely different spectrum of flavors, but there's a lot of variation and room to explore. Oh, I, I'm a gin apologist. For years, I, I fell into the camp of the snobby whiskey enthusiast shitting on clear liquor, but, uh, and I still shit on vodka. Yeah, as well, <laughs> as well you should. As well you should. Work there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the beauty that is gin, there, there was, uh, I don't know if they're still around, but there was a great uh, distiller here in Houston, the only distiller here in Houston making gin for quite some time. 
Uh, and we did a bespoke blend with them and they, you know, as you distill gin, a lot of gin distillers will cook it to vodka. They will make it vodka. And, and essentially the, the, the distillation proof is so high that you, to me, you cook off all the base spirit. Yeah. They would distill to light whiskey and their gin, their gin base was light whiskey and it had so much more flavor, so robust, so aromatic. And I, it changed my mind and I, I, I've apologized. And I watched that video and just watching you guys, by the way, I watched that video at three o'clock this morning. I couldn't see <laughs> uh, But, but I, I, I watched you guys and all immediately agree on which blends you liked and which ones you liked, mo- you know? Awesome. So I, it got me, got me thirsty. I was, I was hoping for an early morning drink, but uh, yeah, I, I was going to ask you how that was coming along and, and seeing when, when can not, we... Not great. Not we're we're going to have to come to plan B. We're, we're counting on you to put this in front of the right people in MGP, Chris. And <laughs> yeah. you, you to make yeah. this happen for us. You're all of your MGP influence. <laughs> yeah, my huge... Uh, that's someone we haven't done anything with yet. Uh, and I don't know that we, we will anytime soon. Most of what we've done so far has been through brokers. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and right. the circling, circling back to sourcing just very briefly... It is also exciting to see how many distilleries of a meaningful size, you know, once they get past the early days of being uh, early days of being a small business, become medium sized, tickling large. Then they start to consider, well, maybe we start out, so maybe start letting people source our products. Right. So, like every week that goes by, there's more and more options on the table for a rectifier for a distillery that wants to be working with other uh, ingredients mm-hmm. to make some really interesting blends. So, and I, and I don't know the answer to this. How big is y'all still? Right now, 25 gallons. But next week. <laughs> but the one that's currently sitting on a, on a, a pallet tumbler? is 150 gallons. Yeah. Oh, it's nice. still small, but for our mm-hmm. physical space, it's taken over in the room. Yeah. Yeah. The goal was to be able to try to create a barrel a week. Yeah. A 50, one 53-gallon barrel a week uh, for, at this phase right. of growth. Yeah. Oh, so um, then what's, what's next? I know you guys are working on a few blends. I know that uh, y- the video I watched, uh, one of the videos I watched was discussing how you guys are just trying to get out to distribution and figure out through the hellscape that was not, you know, 2020, <laughs> mm-hmm. how, you, how you can get these things out to market. And, and uh, not too, too long ago, I came and visited you guys. Me and uh, Daniel had a beautiful cigar on a very mm-hmm. windy day. Uh, and yeah. we were discussing what, what's plans, what's the, the plans for distribution specifically in Texas. Cause that's the only place I care about. Sure. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for Texas, uh, it's going to be a retail play. Most yeah. likely we want to start with total wine. Yeah. And the first product we're going to put out there is going to be, um, the, speaking of Gulf coast, yeah. um, the vodka that we source from Gulf coast. We did and, that originally. So we would have a vodka in the tasting room to make cocktails for people who aren't whiskey drinkers. Yeah. But then you we have to like, have you your know own. what? If we test, it feels very pluggy of me. We just yeah. put a sticker on this morning. It's that's yeah, why it's here. With the Patreon video where we showed you guys. All right, guys, here's what's next. Right. Um. So the goal was to use vodka to test out the distribution channels. Yeah. Because all the whiskey we have right now is limited edition. So, like, when we do a single release, it's you know, two hundred bottles or less. Mm-hmm. And if one of the channels of distribution screws, screws up. something up. Every release we do is sold out. We have absolutely no way of replacing anything that goes missing. But, it's just gone forever, but right? Vodka. But vodka. <laughs> right. So the message we're doing to everybody right now is, all right, guys, we're going to work with uh, an online company that has all the legal shit figured out for 35, 35. states. Yeah. And then we're going to, in Texas, we're going to work with Total Wine first. And then after maybe, who knows. But starting with Total Wine, and we're going to send them all vodka. And then we're going to send all of you to go buy vodka. <laughs> and that's where we're going to figure out all the bugs and the problems and the things we hadn't considered. Once the dust is settled and we figure out that's, hopefully, we figure out that's solid. There's no real issues. We're not losing orders or shipments and things aren't breaking and they're not being sent to the wrong addresses. Uh, then we can start putting whiskey into that process. Yeah. But um, no, it would just be really, really frustrating and very annoying for us too, but especially for people that ordered stuff that they've been waiting for months, if not years to get their hands on. Right. And it's lost in shipment or it's broken or somebody sold it because they didn't realize it was mint reserved for that person. So low risk, just getting a vodka out there and then we'll follow it up with whiskey as soon as we can. Let me ask you, uh, and if if you don't want to, if you haven't quite figured that out yet, just let me know, but which distributors are you talking to in order to do that? 
in Texas, all we're doing is uh, Texas True, Ross Tremonte. He's a super uh, small, like craft kind of dude. He's got a really small amount of brands, but he works his ass off. Right. Um, and he's got a good relationship with Total Wine. So we're, I, the thing is, he approached us three years ago when we started. Mm-hmm. And he was one of the first people, you know, Smart there's, guy. there's distributors who are like, anytime they see a DSP get filed, they're like, hey, 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 I could be your distributor. Hey, 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 right? And, uh, and so I talked to a bunch of different people and I was like, all right, Ross, you're our guy, but here's the thing. I don't have anything to give you. So Ross called me about every two or three months for three years. For three years. <laughs> I would get a text message, but like once a quarter, I get an email and a voicemail and a text message. Yeah. Hey, 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 when can I get some of your stuff? And I'm like, man, I, I can't even get my stuff. Like we, we saw it out in 48 hours. Yeah. I'm sorry. And he's like, that's cool. That's cool. Just let me know when you're ready. So he's just sort of stuck around for three years. And so we sort of felt like, all right. Well, let's give. Let's do it. You're the you're the hot girl who friend zoned the nerd just yeah. long enough, just long enough for, for things to finally work out. Honestly, yeah. like giving giving ambitious people, you know, upstarts, you know, maybe they don't have like a recognizable name. If they're hungry and they're ambitious and they're oh, talented, yeah. they make it make it happen. Like all day, let's give you that opportunity. And they care. Same right. thing with this guy. If he if he's not a choke point. If he right. doesn't limit our ability to do what we need to do, then dude, then let's have, grow him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, everybody. I want to take a quick moment, take a pause in the show and talk to you a little bit about Waterford Irish single malt whiskey. This is an exceptional, different farm to glass, grain to glass, single farm, single origin Irish whiskey that sets itself apart and does everything it can to prove that terroir in whiskey is is a real thing. You can check it out at glassrev.com slash Waterford today. Cheers. So uh, pivoting a little bit, I, I've gone through, uh, you know, you guys have one, not arguably, definitely the most successful pair of whiskey channels on YouTube currently, right? With uh, almost 700,000 subscribers between the two channels, more than 75 million views between the two channels. What and I've noticed, and, and this could have been happening for a long time, but I've noticed specifically that a lot of your content sometimes correlates to the Facebook fight argumentative zeitgeist at times. <laughs> like, like there's a big debate over whether or not your whiskey changes in the bottle short term versus long term. You guys did right. the iteration video. Topical. I, I think, to your point, about half of the videos that are – you know, specifically addressing something that you're seeing in social groups. Um, about half of those is like, oh, that's a topic of conversation. Let's make content about that. It's obviously relevant right now. Mm-hmm. The other half are just pure coincidence. Um, specifically, one of the most recent <laughs> videos we did, with, <laughs> yeah. which is just a really practical, fun, throwaway episode. It was like, hey, let's uh, show di- people different ways to get a broken cork. That had been on our list of possible episodes for out of like a yeah. year. Out of, fun, uh, fun video. Yeah, just a ways to get broken cork out of a whiskey bottle. There's like eight methods we researched, we tried. Um, and then I think it was like 72 hours before that episode was supposed to release. It's Bourbon Night released their cork unstuckening episode. Yeah. And then the Whiskey Dictionary released their cork unstuckening episode. And then it was like, well, I, I guess this is, ours. this is the theme for the month. Yeah. Here's, so a lot of it is just, you know, parallel thinking. Um, and I think half of it is there's a topic of conversation. It's relevant. Let's make a video about it. So one of the one of my favorite ones you've done, uh, I'd love to rehash right here right now, <laughs> is the discussion on the word smooth, 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 smooth. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I loved the episode. I I I felt like there was Daniel's kind of explanation of the word early on was that it was lazy, mm-hmm. and as I'm listening and I'm arguing with the television, uh, I I. I, I Wanted, I want to add to that because I don't think it's that it's just lazy. Yeah. I think that it, because there's no uniform meaning and because it's used in many different ways, that is why it's wrong. Because uh, the, the, and you guys address the proof thing. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me. Yeah, no, no. Let finish your thing. It. Yeah. So, um, so, so you address the proof thing. A lot of people do use smooth to really mean it doesn't burn as much. Yeah, our cultural, unfortunately, our, our U.S. culture around drinking usually entails shots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when it when we can do a shot and it doesn't kill us, 
we assume, right. oh, that's really smooth. That's the good stuff. And, and we assume it's high quality. Right. <laughs> and vice versa, we assume that when something is high proof and there's more inherent burn, that we think that it's bad. Right. And as most of us learn, as you get into spirits, you eventually start moving up in proof as a preference. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's not just that it's, uh, I think it implies that if something is not smooth, it's a bad thing to some people, uh, but also it's, it could be misleading it, because of the non-uniformity uniformity of the word. Yeah, I agree. I think within the context of the episode, Daniel was saying what most whiskey enthusiasts perceive whenever a newcomer says the word smooth, is they will project onto them, oh, they're being lazy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not actually the case. They're not being lazy. It's just where they're at. Yeah, they're using the language they have. So my, yeah. my whole thing about smooth is I don't have a problem with it. When I'm in a tasting and someone uses the word smooth, yeah. I simply ask them questions, right? I, I oh, yeah, my... you know what? You're totally right. So when you say smooth, and then I try to unpack what they mean by smooth, right? My frustration with whiskey people in the word smooth is it's an excuse to shit on newcomers. Oh, sh yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. it's yeah. like, like I, I lived in San Luis Obispo, California for eight years, right? You could always spot an outsider because they called it San Luis, <laughs> right? Where are you going to? I'm going to San Luis for the weekend. Right. And everybody who lived in San Luis Obispo is like, outside like right missouri and missouri and so whiskey snobs or whiskey assholes often use that word smooth as a way to point out somebody who's not actually one of us and i hate that right oh sure um, because i think that the word smooth while doesn't isn't clear to your argument isn't clear enough to actually describe a specific thing yeah right because it's so widely interpreted it's definitely someone trying to make an effort to understand what they're drinking, well, sure, and I, right, and that should be honored, not shit on. And I come back to I always try and find like the simplest packaging, the simplest context for something. And I really like what Eric Waite. Yeah, said. that was smooth, his was my favorite too. Smooth is a texture; it's not a flavor. And whenever somebody says smooth, even if they're really inexperienced, I take it to mean oh, the texture of this isn't sharp or bitey or pointy; it's not hurting you. Yeah. Um, but then you know, if if you're a whiskey enthusiast, a whiskey nerd. You want to get into the flavors. Mm -hmm. Like the texture is like, all right, well, that's pretty, you know, basic. Let's explore what's actually going on with the, the, the nose, the palate, the layers of this whiskey. How does it finish? And most newcomers, I find, are very, very eager to do that. They just need somebody to take them by the hand and give them the framework to even begin to verbalize the things that they're experiencing. I agree completely. I think that we are in this and this is this in lies and there's overlap here. The problem with the hobby, right? So, so in the wine world, there is an accepted certification for being a smart. In the yeah. whiskey world, the education, most of it is online. I mean, all of our regulations are online. And if it's not online, someone online is an expert, but no one likes to use that term. And if you use the term whiskey expert, people are ready to, 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 to jump down your throat. It's something right. that it's something that's so all, whether it's barbecue or whiskey or cars, the cynical nature of the, the snob yeah. mm -hmm. is, is, is inherently part of the process. You're absolutely right. When, when someone does say smooth, then they could tell me, Oh, I've been drinking whiskey for 30 years what's the smoothest whiskey you got? That immediately tells me what really their level of, of either education or experience is with whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, but people will, instead of just identifying it and trying to walk them through it, they want to jump on them and knock them down a peg. It's something that, and I've, I've talked to Daniel about this. I, I struggle running HBS. HBS is the, the largest single market group in North America. It's the yep. focus is Houston. And it is a constant struggle uh, to kind of rein that in because really the difference in education being in any of these groups for maybe six months, right. you, you can become your own version of an expert, your own version of a snob within six months of just soaking up these group, what, what, what these groups can offer. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, a big part of it is whenever somebody gets into anything, we'll, we'll put whiskey aside, but any type of hobby, any type of interest, it could be sports, it could be cars, it could be like, you know, music, metal working music, anything. Um, somebody gets deep into it. They've invested a ton of time and a ton of energy. It becomes very, very important to them and it becomes part of their 
identity. It's punk rock. Yeah, and whenever somebody approaches it much more casually, then a lot of that self-worth is wrapped up in, well, you don't take this nearly as seriously, as seriously as I do. Let me show you how seriously I take this. And that inevitably becomes the condescending type of interaction. And it's like, man, that's just such a turnoff for bringing new people who would be an amazing fit for the community whenever they see somebody not having a connective experience that they want to bring you into this amazing world of whiskey. It's more of a hierarchical experience. How do I make sure that you understand I'm up here and you're down here, which is, that's so frustrating, so counterproductive. That's what's lazy. Forget yeah. smooth. That's lazy. So I have two things with this. One is I think anybody who knows stuff about whiskey, the goal should be to be not a whiskey expert, but a whiskey shepherd. Yeah. Right? There, oh, it's it like in the business, a whiskey in the business world, you've got gurus, but fuck gurus, right? What you really want is... Oh, shit. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. No, I was trying to hear what you said. I thought you said a whiskey shark. Shepherd. <laughs> shepherd. Shepherd. Okay. You eat them for lunch. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Uh, everybody wants to be like, I know things instead of a shepherd whose job it is to guide people into a journey, right? And so, I mean, that's what we're doing at the Whiskey Marketing School, trying to train whiskey shepherds. Right. Um, but the other thing that I think happens is, and this is a truism of human nature, converts are the most extreme in anything, always, Right. Like in religion and politics, and the converts are always the what the people who grew up in it. They're always pretty reasonable. The converts, that's where you get the assholes, right? And so, like for example, in Austin, if you want to find the group of people most angry about all these newcomers, it's the people who just moved here. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like the people who've lived here for thirty or forty years, they're like, eh, it's kind of annoying. It'll, it'll be fine, yeah. but it's fine, right? The people who moved here like five years ago, they're furious about yeah. whoever moved here this year, yeah. right? It's definitely the so same like, with whiskey. Yeah, with whiskey, it's like the guys, when you find the makers and the distillers and the guys who've been in the industry their whole lives, those guys are kind and they're generous and their rule of whiskey is, you know, what do you like, man? Let's just figure it out. It's no big deal. They have no ego. There's no, nothing at stake, right? But you find the self-proclaimed recent convert <laughs> experts and they, one of the laziest ways to mark yourself as in is to mark who's out, yeah. right? right? So the, the shortcut to telling people that I am something is to make sure people know that guy is not. And that's a lazy asshole shortcut to marking yourself as a part of a community is to immediately get in and then turn around and point your finger at who didn't make it across the fence yet, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's what happens in the whiskey groups quite often is the recent converts, you know, six months, a year in, they, they have just, I call it the sophomore philosophy major weakness. <laughs> Yeah, just enough education to think you know everything, right. but but really you're just an asshole, right? <laughs> Not enough education to be wise, right? And so you get people with a certain amount of expertise, and the shortest, easiest way to self-identify is to shit on the new guy. And, and it's like the, uh, yeah, it's like, oh, thank God I'm not a freshman anymore, right? right? The seniors <laughs> yeah, the are all picking suck. on the freshman. Yeah, freshman I'm a sophomore worst. now. Ha ha, let, I'm going to help pick on the freshman, right? <laughs> And, and I think that's what's lazy. Not that we have opinions about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no, no, they're, they're accurate opinions. There's, the whole time you were talking, I was thinking of a, a guy in our group who you just define him perfectly. He's such a nice guy, but he early on, just a couple years ago, he made his way into the guys who've been in this hobby for 30 years, 40 years. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Randy Blank, but he's a legend in bourbon. Randy Blank was the guy who basically kicked off the popularity of the private barrel picks for consumers. Nice. In 2002, he bought a, bo a, a barrel of Old Rip Van Winkle 12 Lot B. So one of the few Pappy Van Winkle barrels sold to retail, the first one was to, to this guy, and he's here in Houston. Uh, very, very wealthy guy, very, very generous guy, very, very... That's not, awesome. Uh, he, I mean, he's not a wave maker. Right. Mm -hmm. But there's a guy in our group that got invited to Randy's get togethers and you know, uh, he got, he got kind of shepherded in to the, the old dogs. I call them the old dogs. Right. I, and now these are people who are wealthy, who've been in the hobby for a long time. So he identifies with, with the elite and you get new people coming in and this guy so nice in person, such a monster online. And I'm not talking about, Wade, I'm talking <laughs> yeah. about someone else, <laughs> but, uh, but, we eventually had to, to get him to understand that uh, 
the, one of the guys he had shit on was a, uh, a U.S. congressman for the district of like, like he was like, he's an important guy. And yeah. I'm like, if your whole identity is being wrapped up in who the people you know and are close to, you right. just, you could have been the guy that taught that congressman the way like you you could have but right. you were so eager to shit on the new guy thinking that he was a new guy and he like no no this guy is a very wealthy important figure and after that he was like all right that makes a lot of sense I'm like but the fact that that's what it takes to get you to understand yeah. to stop I have to tell you that. <laughs> but like we've all gone through that right i mean not not in everything we've always done but we all went through it in high school <laughs> yeah but that was that was right, high all, school everybody has a phase in their life where they're like oh you don't even know yeah well, that was high school. Yeah, yeah. I, I think and i also think it for me at least and what i enjoy about the entire experience the the whiskey space it entirely misses the point i mean you can nerd out about the labels and the brands and the mash bill and the pedigree and all the history all of that stuff but as far as i'm concerned that should really just be the catalyst that should mm -hmm. just be the excuse to get together and hang out and maybe there's a bottle that's so interesting that's a topic of conversation but whiskey as social lubricant and whiskey as tool to make amazing memories together, to make fast. As a friends. unifier, as glue. Yes, yeah. that's the point. Absolutely. That's the point. And then to, to the extent that we want to dive deeper into these bottles and these distilleries and all that, it's like, great. Sometimes something is, is, is interesting enough to do that. But if that's all we're doing, come on. That's a really small universe that I am not eager to participate in. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's something that we all combat and usually need uh, more. Sometimes we need a reminder. Some people need nudges. Some people need extra admins just to help rein that in. <laughs> yeah. You know? So it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, it's hard. I mean, as big as HBS is, the tribe is so much larger, you know, right. by, a, by a multiplier. It, it, How many it, admins do you have? Six. We've got half of that. Yeah. Well, they, and they're busting and they their work ass. Their Wait, wait, wait. Off. They're amazing. Wait, you have three plus yourselves, right? No, uh, we don't. We're technically it. admins, but we're, we can't really, you can't really count on us. Yeah, Come we on. have three so, people who do the work. <laughs> well, to be fair, we have three people who do the work too. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's actually there's, on the ball. More yeah, so yeah. <laughs> there's, always a, real work. there's always a couple extra admins who are there for verbal support in terms of like discussing yeah. something out privately, but not really super active. Yes, we uh, absolutely and, do that. And yeah. honestly, the, those teams, I'm sure well, your admin team as well, they're really like the unsung heroes. They're the ones yes. that make sure it, nothing goes off the rails too, too far. They keep it fun. They keep it interesting. And it's an impossible job. Yeah, they, take, they just are constantly punching bags for things that are not their fault yeah. or, their, or are not their problem yeah. or not their call yeah. very often. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, yeah. there's whiskey involved too. It's a whole yeah. thing. But no, we absolutely appreciate anybody, any community member that's so um, willing and committed to step up and say, hey, yeah, I love this group. I love this community. I want to make sure that it stays within the, the, the guidelines of what we are supposed to be standing for, mm -hmm. what, what this experience is supposed to be. Um, the, the thing that separates just amazingly impressive human beings and the ones that just are smart or, or people that'll have like a great idea is like, hey, you should do this or you should try this versus the ones that say, hey, you should do this and I'm willing to do it. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, here's this thing that needs to be done. <clears throat> I'm volunteering. Yeah. As opposed to, you know what you need to do? Right. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, what's the word? Not backseat drivers, but the, the uh, in football. There's so call, many terms. Yeah, in, Monday in morning football, quarterback. football, they call it like Monday morning quarterback. Yeah, yeah. Armchair so, quarterback. Th there's, yeah. it's not just bringing up an issue. It's having a solution or an idea around that solution and then volunteering to help participate in that solution yeah. would, be, would be the great, the great thing. So, have you guys thought about doing, and you may have already done this, uh, knowing how large your channels are, but myth busting as far as some of the, the like, you know, the, the, the old adage that 95% of the world's bourbons made in Kentucky is completely made up, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a list over on the whiteboard. It's about 115 episodes. Yeah. We would yeah. like to get it's to on the list yeah. someday. Yeah, yeah, it's on the list of things to get Are done. Are you volunteering? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, I, I drove up to Austin to have cigars with Daniel and drove home the same day. So I, Yeah, that's I, true. He did do that. He, he, did, he drove and he brought all the whiskey we drank. Here, get to know Chris Hart. And beer. I like the cut of your gym. And beer. Like weird beer. Yeah. And beer. Yeah, so there's, yeah. This, there's this great uh, company in Houston that uh, – 
uh, I've said this joke a lot that, that that'll, that'll make beer out of a shoe. Like they're, they're, they'll, they'll make a beer with anything. And I brought up a couple, they brought a peanut butter and jelly sandwich beer. Uh, <laughs> they freakishly tastes like, it's, really? It's so weird. Wow, wow, wow. That's they cool. made some with Sour Patch Kids, and so I brought that up there. One was uh, Captain Crunch, wasn't it? One was Captain Crunch, and it tasted just yeah. like the cereal. Just it's like <laughs> Captain Crunch. It, it was, it was fantastic. Have you guys thought about – I know you're not necessarily beer guys. I know that you guys have joked about that. Have you all thought about – because you have said before that you do plan on doing other spirits and bottling it, but not – have you thought about beer? Have you thought about – Maybe we need to get a lines. lot of, of whiskey bottlings under our belt, projects that we've been wanting to do for a long, long time yeah. with the community. Um, and once we have those bottles uh, you know, designed with the, the Magnificent Bastards, they're scaled up, they're out there, people can get their hands on it. Then turning a corner and saying, okay, well, what's, what's, in, what's in the world of beer? And then um, Armagnac and Armagnac and brandy, and like brandy, and you, yeah, yeah. But we got a lot of whiskey, all kinds of options, whiskey making to do before we get. Honestly, started. the reason we're not expanding is because we haven't fulfilled to our community to the level we need to yet, just with whiskey. Yeah. So we can't move on to new and interesting things before we've fulfilled our first round but of there's commitments. There's a lot to explore. I'm very excited about getting in there. I can't do beer, just so you know. So I'll do the beer for it's, you. It's it's primarily because I had a surgery. I can't do carbonation. I can't even do like Topo Chico. So what he's saying is he has you a had, delicate constitution. You had the lap band. What, what, I can't. Yeah, yeah, and like two other things with it. But yes. Gotcha. So the carbonation just destroys me. So. I I'll can't do, do the beer thing. I'll be the beer guy. I'm fine with me. Okay, I love beer. Keep in mind. Yeah, I love beer. Just drink flat beer. I just yeah. I could. Yeah, it's actually. called Guinness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's he my favorite Guinness. beer. He my dad it. always said Guinness is what all other beers want to be when they grow up. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, the Houston Bourbon Society. You, you obviously have built something very very impressive over there. What's next on the agenda for you guys? Is it just continuing to grow, or are there you know further projects like this you want to get into? Uh, so, so we, you know, it's tough, uh, really right now, uh, the rate of growth is getting a little hard to manage and it's already kind of hard to manage. I mean, yeah. Daniel apologized profusely, but he left the group. It's just so intense. Uh, yeah. but that being said, we, we, we've moved away from, as you've mentioned, when you guys do special releases, single barrels, they're, they sell out instantly. We've moved away from as much as possible. I mean, there's still some we'll do because we don't have an option but to do it as a single barrel. But yeah. we're, we're starting to do larger projects. We did an, an Armagnac blend uh, oh, nice. that, that we released statewide. It's all over Texas. Uh, we, we did a four square thing that'll be released soon and that'll be all over Texas. So we're doing, instead of 150 bottle releases, we're doing 600, 900. Uh, That's what I love best about your community is it's not just... And I'm not in it anymore. <laughs> you know. Is that what yeah. you like best about it? <laughs> no, no, yeah, that's, that's probably what everyone else likes best about it. The, uh, no, that's just not just an internet sounding chamber, but that you guys are creating. Yeah. Oh, sure. Right? It's one thing to just sit around passing judgment. It's another thing to create. And so that's, that's one of the things I respect most about the Houston Bourbon Society is you guys also create. I mean, yeah, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. The, the sounding chamber can be a bit tough to deal with at times, but the, the, we did 2000 cases last year of products and projects that came to Texas that wouldn't have come if we didn't do it. Right. It, it, that's 800 and about $850,000 in retail revenue that wouldn't have existed. If we were a bar, we'd be a $6 million bar and that'd be a huge, yeah. a huge bar. Um, so it, it, it has its positives. Uh, we just, you know, and really what I've been trying to do, uh, our focus for the group the last few years is to branch out of the same five bourbons, right? Like I don't just want to do, uh, we did, I think five or six whistle pig barrels last year, which yeah. is great. I love whistle pig, but like, let's, and we just released a tequila barrel. We released a rum barrel. We did a 600 bottle Armagnac blend. So it, it's, it's nice to get outside the bourbon bubble a little bit and to have, uh, other spirits because they deserve your love and attention. And a yeah. big part of it has been Texas, right? So yeah. we, we, we yeah. do a lot with Balcones. We do a lot with uh, the, the Iron Root guys, the Licorice Brothers. Uh, we, to, to take them up there, we, we do something every year, which you guys could totally adopt and we would love to, to see happen. But you guys should do single barrel releases, like have your Patreon supporters come and do a barrel pick. And, you know, it would ramp up the amount that you release. It would, it would make things a bit more 
give people a reason to come visit you guys. Iron Root, we, we took a group of the last two years, COVID killed it last year, but the, the mm-hmm. two years before yeah. that, we did uh, Iron Root Distilling Camp. And we took 15 to 20 people, uh, rented an Airbnb, went up and stayed at Iron Root for two days. We picked out a mash bill. They run a distillation run. And then we tasted through about 20 barrels in their warehouse the next day. Yep. So yep. We, we spent the weekend. Now, they didn't charge us anything for it. We, we, they, they took care of us. And we, have, we, of course, picked out a few barrels to buy and to bring back to Houston. But it's something that I, I'd like to see more happen in Texas as a destination. We have the Whiskey Trail and we have several places that could totally facilitate, uh, maybe not staying on site necessarily, right. but, but yeah. you know. So the, to your point, COVID did throw in a huge We had range. so many plans. Before um, that. And in terms of single barrel stuff, you mentioned Iron Root. It's, it's, it's very funny. Uh, we actually have done some single barrel stuff with Iron Root, where we had the community design a mash bill that they produce. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, Alliance releases, independent bottlings that we've done from distilleries around the country. But one of the things that we've always really wanted to do, to your point, is send, you know, groups of magnificent bastards to specific distilleries at the specific days, have a tasting, choose your barrel, hopefully choose enough barrel where we can get it to a lot of, you know, mm-hmm. enough barrels, choose a few barrels, we can get it to a, a lot of people. That, I think, is one of the most unique and viscerally fun experiences people can actually go on outside of a screen yeah that uh, yeah all day i'm just waiting for this goddamn rona <laughs> <laughs> to clear up so we can get back into the kinds of experiences that i think people really really love and and yeah people. we have an opportunity that even you guys don't have which is that we have a dsp so our we could send people to a distillery and then do a transfer and bond of the barrel they pick, and we could bottle it. Like, we don't even have to dance through all the hoops. Right. Uh, yeah, have, there's a lot of opportunity. I, and again, going back to a point I made very, very early, I just wish more craft distilleries were more savvy about that process. Because <laughs> it is, every time you reach out to somebody, you're starting from scratch. They don't understand oh, the rules, the process. Yeah. Now, we reached out to one of my all-time favorite whiskeys of 2020. Uh, the, my favorite bourbon of the entire year that I ever tried. And they, we were like, hey, we want to buy a barrel. Yeah. And we had to get on a phone call with like three people. And they were like, well, we don't know. You know we've never really done this before. I, don't, I mean, we sell our barrels to distributors you know, by the bottle. And, we, and, and I'm like, no, no, no. That's not what we're talking about. Right. And then we, we got down to where they were like, okay, maybe we can figure this out. And, and I'm like, no, I'm going to be talking about you to like 100,000 people. <laughs> like, let me have a barrel. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then they were like, well, you know, uh, how do we get you the barrel? And I'm like, it's called a transfer and bond. <laughs> yeah. That, like, they had no, like, well, what's that? Honestly, well, we, we just. Because only sourcing people know what transfer and bond is. We just right? need a landing page uh, where if there's somebody that we think needs a lot more exposure, a lot more awareness of what they're doing. Yeah. Say, like, hey, check out this landing page. Here's like the broad strokes, the really simple explanation. This is what a transfer and bond is. Right. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Was it a big distillery? Do what? Is it a big distillery or a craft distillery? No, no, it's Hooper family. I mean, I could talk about them all day because they make amazing whiskey, which is the main point. Uh, They had a sherry cask bourbon uh, that's Hooper family winery, who's their bourbon or whiskey line is Starlight. Yeah. And their sherry cask bourbon is the best bourbon I had all last year, period. Well, thank God the prideful goat came out this year. (laughs) Thank God what? (laughs) Thank God the goat came out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank God. (laughs) <laughs> uh, no, it was amazing. And, uh, but then we reached out to them. They just had no grid for anything we were asking yeah. at any level. Yeah. Uh, and like, that, that, yeah. That's one of the things I, I keep talking about with Texas is everyone's willing to say yes. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, we, we, we gave, uh, and I've talked about this at length too, but we, we gave a, a barrel we did with Elijah Craig uh, to a local honeybee farmer and he aged some honey in it. And then I just called back honey. He's like, hey, you guys want to put some single malt in our honey barrel? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, just come bring it to us. And, yeah. and then now we're, and now we're about to release it, right? That's so, awesome. What's the worst that, is, that could happen? That is so uh, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the era of yes is what I think is, is, is slingshotted Texas whiskey into what yes. it is now. Is totally everyone's agree. willing to, to work together and to try something. So I totally uh, agree. Well, listen, I, you guys have been absolutely uh, fantastic. I feel like there's so many more things I want to talk to you about. <laughs> but I, I say we do it in person over a few Cuban cigars. Hey, I'm in on that all day. Done. Yeah. So, uh, this time I'll, be- I'll provide the cigars. 
<laughs> you did the work last time. <laughs> but still bring the weird beers. But still bring yeah, the whiskey yeah, yeah. and the weird beers. A hundred percent. I'll hit you up later. We'll, we'll make it work. And uh, thanks so much. Is there anything you guys want to plug real quick before we go? Where can people find you if they don't already know? Uh, on YouTube, the Whiskey Vault channel and the Whiskey Tribe channel. And yeah, thank you so much for inviting us. Man. Yeah, it's cheers, been a lot of fun. We appreciate thank it. You. No, absolutely, guys. Cheers. cheers. Balcony's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more.